This presentation is about ethical subjectivism as well as the role that reason plays in ethics. As always, you should have read the course material before viewing the presentation. And, also as always, this lecture is designed only to cover the key points of the readings and some additional insight and help elucidate the more difficult areas of the text. More information than this may be included in the quizzes and tests, so make sure that you do do the readings in their entirety. That said, let's move on. Today we will be discussing ethical subjectivism, presenting some criticisms of it, and then finally saying a little something about the role that reason plays in ethics and how to approach ethical questions in general. Ethical subjectivism is the view that moral terms are just ways of expressing approval or disapproval, commanding, or types of exclamations. This view is opposed to the idea that moral terms express propositions about actual objective facts about the world that can be either true or false. There are two types of ethical subjectivism that we will be discussing, simple subjectivism and emotivism. Each of these various formulations or versions of ethical subjectivism defines its views a bit differently. James Rachels uses the example of homosexuality in his books to illustrate ethical subjectivism. For variety, another example could work just as well. People have different views about morality. Some people think homosexuality is wrong, some people think that the death penalty is morally required, while others think that it is wrong. People differ about their views on abortion, and so forth. But there is another position people may take besides saying these things are either right or wrong. Some people may think that there is no moral fact in the matter at all. To use capital punishment as our example, people holding this position would say, capital punishment is neither morally right or morally wrong. People just feel differently about it. As an analogy, an ethical subjectivist might say, some people like chocolate ice cream better than strawberry ice cream, and some people like strawberry ice cream better than chocolate, but there is no non-subjective fact of which tastes better. Different people just prefer different flavors of ice cream. Ethics is like that. To contrast, non-subjectivist theories of ethics hold that at least some ethical issues are not like the ice cream case. They are not just matters of taste or expression. The subjectivist, on the other hand, thinks that moral terms or statements should be treated in much the same way as something like the phrase, tastes better. Simple subjectivism is the view that moral terms merely express approval or disapproval by the speaker, writer, or evoker. Now we should take notice about what this theory is actually saying about ethics. It is a theory about what ethical terms really mean. In other words, it is a theory about what moral terms really refer to. So under this theory, telling the truth is the right thing to do really just means I approve of truth telling. Or you should tell your aunt that you broke the vase really just means I approve of you telling your aunt that you broke the vase. Or your friend needs you, you ought to be there for her really just refers to your own personal approval or disapproval. It just means I approve of you comforting your friend. Or you shouldn't tease your brother just means I disapprove of you teasing your brother. Or, lighting kittens on fire is morally unacceptable, really just means I disapprove of lighting kittens on fire. And as a final example, a statement like it is immoral to kill a person for his or her wallet isn't a statement about objective facts. It just means I disapprove of murdering people for their wallets. And so on like this for any moral sentence you could construct. Rachels provides two objections to simple subjectivism. Objection 1. Simple subjectivism can't account for moral disagreement. Let's take the ice cream example again. If I say chocolate tastes best and you say strawberry tastes best, and we each understand that by best we mean best to me, then we are really not disagreeing. It is perfectly consistent for chocolate to taste best to me and for strawberry to taste best to you. Rachel's objection is that moral arguments do not seem to be like that. Rachel's uses the example of Foreman and Falwell. Falwell says that homosexuality is immoral, while Foreman says that it is not. According to simple subjectivism, Falwell is really just saying, I disapprove of homosexuality, and Foreman is really just saying, I approve of it. But then where is the disagreement? Surely Foreman, for example, would agree that Falwell disapproves of homosexuality. Yet these two people take themselves to be in disagreement. The point here has nothing to do with the morality of homosexuality. The point is that both Foreman and Falwell take themselves to be disagreeing with each other. 
Rachel summarizes the argument in this way, saying that if simple subjectivism were correct, there would be no disagreement between them. Therefore, simple subjectivism cannot be correct. Before moving on, it is important to note that one thing to ask yourself is whether or not you can form a counterargument to either the main claims or the counterclaims such as those made by Rachel's. This goes for all the readings. You should always be questioning the reasoning presented to you. One objection here might be simply that they really take themselves to be disagreeing but are wrong. Still, Rachel seems right that it would be very odd for us to always be wrong when we use language in this way. Objection 2. Simple subjectivism implies that we are always right. The reasoning behind this objection is pretty straightforward. If moral statements are nothing more than our personal approval or disapproval, how could we ever be wrong about them? Well, we could lie about whether we approve of something, but that isn't the same thing as being wrong about it. We could approve of different things at different points in our lives, but again, we are still never wrong when we do the approving or disapproving. We seem to have direct knowledge of whether we approve or disapprove of something, and therefore simple subjectivism implies that we cannot be wrong about our sincere moral claims. But Rachel's claims that we can be wrong about moral judgments, and further that most of us take it that we can be wrong about them. If we can be wrong about moral claims, and if simple subjectivism says we cannot be, then simple subjectivism must be wrong. Emotivism is a version of subjectivism that has been designed to avoid some of the objections mentioned previously. The essential difference between emotivism and simple subjectivism is that simple subjectivism moral claims are taken to describe facts. Unlike most ethical theories, simple subjectivism does not claim to describe external moral facts, but it still claims to describe facts about the language user's attitudes, that is to say approval or disapproval. Emotivism, on the other hand, claims that moral terms do not refer to any facts at all. This is how emotivism is different from simple subjectivism. A language act that does not attempt to express a fact cannot be either true or false like claims in simple subjectivism. In simple subjectivism it is, for example, either true or false that Falwell approves of homosexuality. This is a propositional claim about the world. Emotivism, however, claims that moral terms actually do not refer to any facts at all, not even facts about what one approves or disapproves of. Note, however, that this is still not moral skepticism because emotivists do claim that moral speech acts are meaningful even if they are not factual. How can it be that moral terms are meaningful, in other words not just meaningless noise, and yet do not refer to facts? We can see what emotivists are getting at by analogies to other speech acts. Consider statements like the following, ouch, or go team, or answer the phone. None of the above statements report facts. None of them can be said to be true or false. Ouch is an exclamation of pain. Go team is a cheer of encouragement. And answer the phone is a command. So let's look at how emotivism would interpret some possible moral statements. First, public nudity is wrong. Second, it is morally impermissible to steal. Third, humility is a virtue. These translate to, the first translates as, yuck, public nudity, or don't be naked in public. The second translates as, boo, stealing, or don't steal. And the third can be translated as, hooray for humility, or be humble. Of course, you can translate these moral statements with words other than boo or yuck. The important idea here is that the emotivist claims that moral terms perform these kinds of speech acts, as opposed to reporting facts which can either be true or false. Moral language is a form of speech act that does not refer to true or false propositions about the world, but the speech act still holds meaning as part of a language game. If you recall, we mentioned two major objections to simple subjectivism. These are not the only two possible objections, but they are the two that seem to be the most commonly cited and also the two that Rachel uses. The first problem was that simple subjectivism seemed to make disagreement about morality impossible since each person only refers to his or her own approval or disapproval with moral terms. Rachel's used the example of Foreman and Falwell debating homosexuality. 
Simple subjectivism cannot locate a disagreement according to the criticism, since each is really just saying, I approve of or I don't approve of. Emotivism attempts to solve this problem by showing that while moral terms do not allow people to disagree about facts, they do show disagreement about attitudes or desires. So under an emotivist interpretation, Falwell desires that people never have or act on homosexual feelings, and Foreman desires that homosexuals not be criticized and that homosexuals be free to act on their feelings. This is called disagreement in attitude. Again, what is important here has nothing to do with the debate over homosexuality. The important point that is being made about emotivism here is that it seems to preserve a real form of disagreement even though it is not it is about attitudes and desires and not facts that people are disagreeing. And therefore the first objection against simple subjectivism simply does not apply to it. The second objection to simple subjectivism was that according to the theory we seem to always be right in our moral judgments. Since it seems that we are sometimes wrong in our moral judgments, the counter-argument says that simple subjectivism must be incorrect. Notice that the key to this objection has to do with being able to be right, and since emotivism does not interpret moral claims in a way that they can be either true or false, that is to say right or wrong, this objection does not apply to emotivism. But there are objections to emotivism. On the previous slide, we noted that emotivism avoids the problem of always being right about moral claims by interpreting moral claims as speech acts which are neither true or false, in other words, which cannot be right or wrong. But Rachel's and others object that we do sometimes correctly judge an act to be moral. Rachel's chooses such a moving example that I'm going to reuse it here. He says, On January 26, 2004, an eight-year-old girl named Katie Shelton was walking down the street in Seymour, Indiana. Suddenly, she was confronted by two Rottweilers, each weighing over 80 pounds. The dogs knocked Katie down and bit her repeatedly. The little girl's life, however, was saved by the heroic actions of 14-year-old Mark Friedrich, who lived nearby. When Mark saw what was going on, he rushed out of his family's house with two sticks and attacked the dogs. According to Rachel's, we know that we are right when judging Mark to have done something moral, but emotivism would have to say that what Mark did was neither right or wrong. The argument is that if we are right about our judgment that it was moral, then emotivism must be wrong. Before we look at the next objection to emotivism, we need to first say a little something about why reason has such an important role to play in ethical judgment. This is not the first time that we have looked at the relationship of reason and ethics. If you recall, Rachel's discussed this in brief at the end of chapter 1 as well. Recall what Rachel's has to say. When we feel strongly about an issue, it is tempting to assume that we just know what the truth is without even having to consider the arguments on the other side. Unfortunately, however, we cannot rely on our feelings no matter how powerful they may be. Our feelings may be irrational, they may be nothing but the products of prejudice, selfishness, or cultural conditioning. At one time, for example, people's feelings told them that members of other races were inferior and that slavery was God's plan. Moreover, people's feelings can be very different. Thus, if we want to discover the truth, we must let our feelings be guided as much as possible by reason. This is the essence of morality. The morally right thing to do is always the best supported by argument. Reason is important for determining ethical truths for the same reasons that it is important for determining any other truths. It helps one see past their own biases, instinctual judgments, and their simple gut feelings which may be wrong. Consider the role of reason in science, for example. Through scientific reasoning, that is to say through empirical data and reasoning about that data, we are able to determine facts such as the Earth orbits the Sun. Notice, however, how reason here is letting us see past our normal instincts. Imagine that you were never told that the Earth orbited the Sun, and that instead you simply noticed that every 24 hours the Sun and Moon and stars moved across the sky. It sure wouldn't seem like the Earth orbits the Sun. Our natural instincts would tell us that instead the sun and stars are moving around the earth. It is only through careful reasoning and data collection that Copernicus and others discovered otherwise. In a similar way, the role of reason in ethics is to help us see past, beyond, or through our more instinctual reactions in order to better get at the truth. This brings us to the second objection against emotivism, which can be leveled against simple subjectivism as well. Both forms of subjectivism 
do not have such a role for reason, since, under these theories, there is no deeper truth to get at. To go back to the case of liking strawberry or chocolate ice cream, nobody has to pause and reflect on reasons to determine which one they like better. Yet, when people try to determine what they are to do in, situ in situations that we say are of a moral nature, most people it spend a great deal of effort reasoning about what the right moral choice is. If all there was to morality were subjective feelings or expression of desires and attitude, there should be no need for such reasoning. Rachel's argument is that since we do engage in such reasoning, something must be wrong with the emotivist theory. So then, why are subjectivist and relativistic positions so common? Rachel says that the reason is that at first there seems to be no proofs in ethics. People often do not think that ethical investigation can arrive at moral facts. But Rachel's, and most other ethicists, think that this is wrong upon closer inspection. He thinks that there are essentially two reasons why people often mistakenly think that there are no such proofs in ethics. First we tend to focus on borderline or controversial cases. And second, we confuse the idea of giving a proof with the idea of convincing others that that proof is correct. One reason it seems like it is hard to come up with solid ethical conclusions according to Rachel's is that we tend to focus on controversial cases when we think about ethics. If you were asked to think about ethical issues, you would probably think of items such as these. Is abortion morally acceptable? Is capital punishment a morally permissible kind of killing? Is it morally right for a doctor to help a patient who is slowly dying in pain kill herself or himself more quickly? But notice that these are some of the most complex and difficult issues in ethics. Issues such as the following would generally not be considered controversial. Was the Holocaust morally wrong? Is it okay to beat up people for fun? Is it morally acceptable to do pharmacological experiments on people without their knowledge or consent? Rachel's points out that questions like those we find in the first set seem difficult and might frustrate some into thinking that there are no ethical answers. But the vast majority of people would not find the second set of questions to be controversial at all. And indeed, most people navigate through their lives making many decisions that would affect others, in other words ethical decisions, without difficulty. It is only in such very rare cases, usually where our general moral values come into conflict, such as the value of mercy with the value of preserving human life, or where certain key facts are uncertain or in debate, that the difficult ethical questions arise. The other reason Rachel's believes that many people think that ethics is subjective is because they confuse the ability to give a proof with the ability to convince another person that the proof is correct. Rachel's gives several examples of ethical proofs. Let's give a couple of new ones here. Suppose I am making the claim Julie is mean. How could I prove this moral judgment? Well, suppose that I show the following. Julie picks on the unpopular kids at school by starting and spreading vicious rumors, which are lies about them, and by humiliating them in front of other classmates. She also toys with people's affections, enjoys getting boys to get into bloody fistfights over her, and enjoys sowing discord amongst her friends. At home, she pits on her younger sister by performing such extreme acts as shaving her head bald, and in her spare time, she likes to torment her cat by putting it in the dryer. What's more, there are no apparent external excuses or explanations for her behaviors. Haven't I just proven that Julie is mean? Rachel's would say yes. Another example. Suppose I said Shelley is kind. This is clearly another ethical judgment, this time a positive one. How might I go about proving it? Suppose I show that Shelley always makes time for people who need her help, even when she is very busy or would rather be doing other things. Though she isn't a sucker, she always helps when somebody needs a favor she can reasonably provide. Furthermore, she isn't just a person that has a hard time saying no to others who ask for things, because she is thoughtful of others, often offering help unasked. Also, from the way she smiles, one can tell that she truly enjoys making others happy. Does the above show that Shelley is kind? it seems to go a long ways towards proving that she is. Now an important note, don't confuse giving proof with giving absolute proof that shows a conclusion can never be wrong. Such proofs are often not possible in science either, although in both cases you may be able to get close to certainty. 
But now suppose somebody, call him Larry, disagrees with these proofs. Suppose Larry instead says that Julie is not a mean person. Suppose further that he does nothing to disprove any of these claims about her, or show the things that she did in a different light, or add new very good things that she has done. Larry is unconvinced by the argument that Julie is mean. But does this mean that we did not prove that Julie is mean? It seems that a more reasonable conclusion is that we have proven our point and that Larry is just wrong. Believe it or not, this has an analog with proofs in other fields, including the sciences. When Galileo gave his proof that objects of different weights fall at the same speed, he convinced almost nobody and it remained extremely controversial. When Alfred Wagner gave his proofs of continental drift, he was humiliated and virtually nobody accepted his view within his lifetime, though we now know it to be true. Note, what is important here isn't just that these people happen to come to true conclusions. What is important is that their proofs, that their reasoning, prove to be sound. I would like to conclude this lecture with a reminder of Rachel's minimum conception of morality. Morality is, at the very least, the effort to guide one's conduct by reason while giving equal weight to the interest of each individual affected by one's decision. In other words, according to Rachel's, any theory of morality must be the product of reason and fulfill what he calls the requirement of impartiality. And that wraps up this presentation. Again, remember that these lectures are meant to supplement the readings, not replace them. There are more details in the text itself, so please make sure that you read carefully. Until next time.